So let us understand what is this doctrine of indemnity. See, as soon as I say indemnity, indemnity says to make good of the loss. Is it right? See, when I say indemnity, I would indemnify you. Indemnity bond has been given. Suppose tomorrow if there is a loss going to be caused to you, then that loss, what is going to be caused, should be will be compensated. That is, it is, I can say that, that is by you giving a right of indemnity, you are assuring your person, don't worry, I am there. If in case of any, any eventuality or any risk that has occurred, I will manage out that eventuality. I will manage out and put you in the same position. Or I can say you that it is something I can say, it is a risk sharing activity. It is a contract wherein a person agrees to share the risk of what you have entered into or what has been carried between the parties. So the whole motto of this principle is that to see that the person even in case of loss, even in case of loss, even in case of such occurrences of risk, he should be put and placed in the same position as before the loss has occurred to him. That is make him in the same, make him, make him comfortable, make him and stay, place the person in the same position, in the same position as he was before the loss that has been occurred with him. So in that notion it says, that is indemnity comes in and it speaks as how indemnity shall be effected with. That's where I again go repeat the same thing. All insurance policies except life policy or personal accident or your health policy, except these policies, that's what it said, but all insurance contracts are not a contract of indemnity, which means to say that all policies except life insurance or personal accident or your health policy, except these policies, all other policies are nothing but a contract of indemnity. So your burglary, your fire, your property, your marine, all these insurances or your cattle now which we has come up or husbandry insurances animal husbandry insurances all this comes under the category of the contract of indemnity why they gave out an exception is this my friends human life cannot be valued in terms of money nor human life cannot be compensated in terms of money if my father dies that cannot be compensated in terms of money you cannot value out the, the death of my father or death of my grandfather. So in that case or in that notion it says that indemnity would not work out there. And what is this indemnity says with? What is this it confers with? It says if in case where after having taken the insurance policy, if a person is required to be indemnified with that Indemnity speaks upon with that to put a person or to make good of the losses what he has suffered with. That is, he would be placed in the same position only to the ex extent of loss which is valued with. But human life cannot, as I then said, human life cannot be valued. Human life cannot be equated in terms of money. Maybe say as a father I might be earning uh, 30k, 40k, 50k or 1 lakh or so. But, but. That is only what I am earning. But my do my death of oh, do my death which creates into the loss of my family can be evaluated definitely. Or it can be compensated in terms of money. Suppose say an example is suppose if I am earning 50,000 K or 40,000 K and if the if the if uh, the company says that if the company says that okay I am going to give you 40,000 K estimating the 60 years of your husband to my wife. So, okay, I'll pay paying you 60,000 K for the uh, each month, valuing about for 16 years. Will it be compensated? No, definitely not because I might be paying certain money to them, but still that is not where I'm completely compensating in the terms of loss what my wife has incurred with. So, that is the reason why my friends, we still say that that is to a person, that is to a life of a person, or to an individual, that is to the life of an individual, you cannot say that it is a contract of indemnity. That is where how it differs with. So what we can understand here is this, my friends, it says whatever the profit that you are going to get in 
or whatever the event that could happen in or whatever the gain that you would have caused in if there is a loss to that of the property if you have a loss to that of the gain what is going to be occurred with except of life then the doctrine of indemnity can be allowed with and what it says what this contract of indemnity speaks with this contract of indemnity says that you would be compensating to the loss only to the extent of loss that you have incurred this is an important criteria you have to understand see under the contract of insurance when we say it is a contract of indemnity the what the co company is saying what is what the insurer is saying is that i would compensate to you to the extent of loss what has been caused to you and i put you in the same position as you were before so the company is liable only to the extent of loss and would not allow you to make a profit from of the happening of an event so you are not by 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 the result of the risk event occurrences you are not allowed to make a profit probably my elderly friends if they are viewing this they would be understanding when big kids camp was got under fire the question came up before the court was this that whether the company has a right to claim such amount of money and the court, the court made an observation saying that the company that is the the in assured or the insured is only entitled to the extent of loss say for example suppose i am owning a a sari shop a big sari shop a, a big showroom i am holding with maybe my sari shop my my sari shop what uh, i might have insured for fire and it is about three floors maybe the first floor of my sari shop was burnt completely burnt and the flames have also gone up and have destroyed my off of the area of that sari showroom now i might have taken an insurance for 10 crores of rupees but am i entitled to hold this 10 crores of rupees says no that is not a contract of indemnity what contract of indemnity says is that or the doctrine of indemnity says is that suppose if your sari shop which is consisting of three floor is burned if it is completely burned then the value of that will be taken suppose what is the value of the sarees which you are holding maybe the other allied uh, uh, losses which could have incurred by you can also be considered that but if my sarees up suppose in the first floor it is 3 lakh 3 crores and in the second floor it is only 3 crore and in the third floor it is just 1 crore now if half of my area of my sari shop is lost i'm just giving an example here that is completely 3 lakh then it is 1 and 1 and half lakh so what i'm entitled to is only to 4 and a 4 and a half crores of rupees i'm entitled to though my claim is 10 crores of rupees but in life insurance if you look suppose say today i may incur a debt after taking the policy maybe within 15 days or 1 year or 3 years or 10 years i may incur or i may uh, happen to the eventuality that is death could be caused to me the in such case what happens is that my family members are entitled to all this 10 crores of rupees but the same is not here the same is not here for the reason that see what the very basic principles of indemnity says is that wherever where the loss is caused to you wherever where the occurrences has happened and to the extent of the eventuality to the extent of the loss what has been incurred would be compensated even where you have 10 crores of rupees the insurance which you have taken with but still but still only to the extent of loss what has been caused to you you are entitled to and not the entire 10 crores of rupees that is what the contract of indemnity speaks with so what we understand here is that the whole contract or the doctrine of indemnity says is that that you are going to be compensated only to the extent of what loss and you will be put to the extent of whatever the loss that you have suffered that is you would be taken out from the risk only to the extent of what the loss has been caused to you and you will not be allowed to make a profit from out of such loss which is going to be occurred with you are not allowed to it so this is what the indemnity speaks with and when it comes to the fire insurance my friends generally we say 
fire and marine insurance or the contract of indemnity. But I have a limitation even in respect of fire insurance. See, when it comes to the fire insurance, see, all fire insurance may not be a contract of indemnity because majority we say that as fire insurance is a contract of indemnity. But that does not mean to say that all contracts of fire insurance is a contract of indemnity. For the reason this, suppose if I have taken a fire insurance where the insurer has guaranteed me to a particular sum of money in case of eventuality. Suppose say whatever the loss it could be, the fire, if the insurer has agreed in case of fire insurance that he would pay him 3 lakhs of rupees. Whatever the loss it could be, whether it is 1 rupee or 10 crore, whatever it is. If the insurer has agreed to pay 3 lakhs of rupees as a guaranteed amount in case of any such eventuality by fire, then that is not called to be as contract of indemnity or it does not serve the principles of contract of indemnity because here the insurance company is not making you a loss or it is not indemnifying you for the loss. It is only giving you such money of what it has been guaranteed out with. So in that sense, if you look upon with, it is not a contract of indemnity. So rest of this, you can say, of course, marine is completely a contract of indemnity. It is completely a contract of indemnity and nothing more than that. This is the one thing you can say with the contract of indemnity. And what is the importance of this doctrine? Friends, when it comes to the importance of this doctrine, this doctrine, in fact, is a, it provides a social security. Why I say it is a social security is that in case of any eventualities, you are entitled to, that is the company or the insurer would bear the loss and put you in the same position so that in, in society, you are in, in, in your business concern or in your society or in your family, it allows you to lead your life in a normal manner. That is why we call it as it is a form of a social security. And it is always conferred or it is always concerned against the losses of the property. That is only with respect to all losses in the property and nothing more than that. That is, it says against the loss of the property and it prevents it you from the damages and allows you to enjoy in the same position. It allows you to enjoy in the same position. This is what it speaks with. It also emphasizes to establish that the premium should be very low. Why it emphasizes the premium should be very low is that, see, I may take the policy. Suppose say if I have a property of 4 crore rupees and I may take the policy of 10 crore rupees. But what is the benefit? Anyway, it says that, anyway, it says that, that is in a contract of indemnity, you are only entitled to the extent of loss what has incurred to you. So the addition of 6 crores what is there may not be of worth for you. So once when it is not worth for you, what do you opt for? Would you like to go for 10 crores instead of 4 crores? You would always opt for 4 crores of rupees. So when you opt for 4 crores of rupees, virtually or naturally we can say that your premium would also get low. So it looks at that emphasizing to see that the premium is very low. And it at the same time it also says that uh, it restricts saying that that your insurance that is what you are taking an insurance need not be should not be a overburden or over uh, insured or it shall also be undervalued with. It also emphasizes looking to that area and it also provides that to maintain the legality of the insurances that is it should not be a speculative it should not be illegal. It's, it also calls for the maintaining of the legality. So in this way, my friends, we shall see that contract of insurance, that is especially in the contract of insurance, indemnity plays an important role as a necessity to the contract, but not to that of all the contracts. As I said, not to that of all the contracts mean life insurance or personal accident or health insurance are outside the ambit of this contract and those are not considered to be as the contract of indemnity and how is their methods that is carried in the contract of indemnity see how does the company that is insured satisfies you with the loss one is 
the commonest way is by way of cash payment the commonest way that is the company may usually enter into an agreement with you that is in case of loss suppose if you have incurred a loss of 3 crore then pay 3 crores of rupees that is the way one in which the loss is going to be compensated or the second way is by way of replacement the insurance company may usually or generally it says that usually prefers to have a replacement where if the insurance is against to a particular property on a particular property so when i take an insurance the company would undertake to replace that part or replace that goods in place of the damaged one example i can tell you like this a car if i am owning and if that car has been met with an accident or is met with an accident as a result of that maybe the right door of the car has got completely damaged the rest are good enough then what can the company do the company can replace this door itself and have a new door in place of the previous one so this can also be accepted and this is how oh so that you would be holding the car in the same position as you are holding much before the accident that's what another way in which it satisfies to you with the loss the third one is it can also go for a repairing repairing is better method which the, uh, usually the company hops for where why i say is that suppose the same car accident if you take if that could be repairable to the satisfaction of the insured allow allow the person to get it repaired so that he can have the same type or the same condition in which the car was in with him before and what is the benefit one why the company hops for this is this see when you go take your vehicle for a repair after the accident has incurred they have a bonus on this the bonus is that they say no i am not giving you any insurance or insurance coverage will not be there for that of the plastic goods look at this say like the bumper and all other which which are of fiber or which are of plastic or they say that it is half of the value that we are going to give it to that now what is it happening by repairing certain things you would have some benefit in you has that benefit would be a bonus on your part so this is one another kind where the company would hop for and if not this the fourth one is reinstatement or reinstallment see reinstallment is that is something with regarding to the building or plant usually this i'll be going as a separate heading when i come to my future discussion that like explaining to you with the doctrine of this so reinstate installment is that suppose if the if a machinery if a plant is totally destroyed or if a building is totally destroyed or if a godown is totally destroyed or if a warehouse is totally destroyed shed is totally destroyed then what can the company do is that instead of paying you the money it can erect it can plant you with the new plant it can install with the new plant it can come out with the new warehouse for you or go down for you a shed for you that is the company itself can undertake and it can provide you with this right and that way it can put you back into the same position so in these methods or by these ways the indemnity can be satisfied by the company mind this my friends when we speak entirely with the indemnity this contract of indemnity is not a contract which has been made in the insurance contract it has been taken from the contract act we read it in the contract act and if we are going to understand what is indemnity we go to the definition there and understand what an indemnity is let me not get into the contract now but how does that differs from the contract here how that contract of indemnity differs in in when we look at from the view point of a contract of insurance so there i can say you like this my friends in case of a insurance contract indemnity is that where it is associated with the principal the guarantor and the person who is required to perform it because there we always see there is three parties it is always associated with three parties that is creditor the principal and debtor there are three parties that is sorry surety is also the creditor principal debtor and surety these three parties are there in case of a indemnity what we understand in case of the 
insurance, I mean contracts. But when it comes to the insurance, indemnity, though we take the meaning of the same thing, but it is understood in a limited sense here. That element of guarantee here goes missing out. I am not giving you a guarantee. When Once when I give you a guarantee, it is more or less it becomes a wager in its nature. So, we shall say that it is not a guarantee what I am giving to you. It is, we do not give you any guarantee. We only replace you or reinstallment or reinstate you from that of the loss what is going to be caused. So, in case of indemnity, that is in a contract sense, we only say that we have only two parties. That is, one is the insured and the insured or the insurer and the assured. We see only two parties who would one would undertake to indemnify the loss what has been caused to that of the another. So this is one such other case wherein we see the doctrine of indemnity goes with and again my friends this is an important question from the point of examination which could be asked for your main question or for that of your short notes. The next topic I would be discussing to you is subrogation and contribution. Again, these are the two doctrines which are on the way of having explaining as the, to the necessity of insurance contract and we call all this, that is especially subrogation, doctrine of subrogation, doctrine of contribution and doctrine of reinstallment or reinstatement is considered to be as a special doctrines under the insurance contract. So, let us also understand these two doctrines. One is the doctrine of subrogation and the other one is doctrine of contribution. What is this subrogation? What is this subrogation? By very mere meaning of it, it means to say substitution. That is, if I am having a right of having being substituted in place of another person, then that act of substitution is said to be called as subrogation. And this right is going to be provided under the insurance contract or in the insurance law where if one person satisfies the claim of another and by satisfying that claim, if the right exists in him to claim such satisfied money, then we exercise the right of subrogation. It has to be always understood that this principle of subrogation should always be understood along with the principles of indemnity, my friends. It should be understood along with indemnity. And it has a relationship with also with that of the indemnity. And only difference that what we can see here is that wherever where the principles of indemnity is applied with or to all such kinds of contract, that is, except we see. In case of indemnity, it is except to the life we see in all other cases the indemnity is applied with. But out of those contracts of indemnity, that is insurance contracts of indemnity, in some cases, to some areas, the doctrine of subrogation applies to it. It goes little more filtered with, it goes little more uh, uh, near in depth of the claiming of the right in respect of the person. And this principle is applied only under specific circumstances or I can say under special circumstances. That is the reason why I said that is it is called to be as a special doctrines under the insurance contract act. It is a special doctrine which provides saying this that whenever when the contract is entered into and if the person has performed upon his contract then he is also at the same time entitled to have a right of subrogation. And this subrogation is in term is an equitable right, I can say. It is an equitable right. That is, it is based on the principle, this doctrine is developed on the principles of equity. And what is the insurance law speaks with? Subrogation, as to subrogation is, subrogation is a right given to the insurer, not the insured, I repeat this. It is a right given to the insurer who has paid the loss and put himself in the place of the assured. That is, having satisfied the money of what the 
insure insurer has undertaken to pay it the insured once as soon as is satisfied he steps into the shoes of the assured and forms to be or stands to be in the position of the insured and he has a right to claim with that of the another person a simple example to establish this that is if in case of an accident maybe the accident might have caused because of the negligent act on the part of the opposite party when an accident is caused because of the negligent of the opposite party for which the insurer has to undertake the risk for that of the insured and accident has caused of the negligent act of the opponent party resulted into severe loss or damages to that of the insured now because of the policy that is in existence the insured is required to pay to the insured and the insured insurer pays to the insured once when it pays to the insured what is happening there was a negligent act because of that negligent act the occurrence has happened and for no fault of this insurer the company has already paid the money so in such case what happens is that this company steps into the shoes of the insurer insured or the assured and tries or takes the claim or exercises is right again a such person who has incurred such a loss to the insurance company so that is what is called as subrogation that is by way of substitution having satisfied it substitutes into the shoes of another and thereafter it becomes a claim there so we say that on the satisfaction of the insured loss the company gets that is the insurer is substituted has against to the third parties i can say you like this my friends subrogation is rather than a remedy it is a right on the part of the insurer i can say it is not a right on the part of the insured because insured is already been paid with the money but it is a right is against the insurer that is it is not a remedy but a right that is where it takes place or having satisfied it takes place by operation of law and it depends with variety of the ways and depending upon the circumstances of the case that is only constraint here is this it says that under law the insurer is not having a right to go against the third person on the reason of subrogation please mind this he is not allowed to go and the, with the with the right against the person he is not allowed to go in his own name he has to go only through that of the insured unless where unless where where there is a deed of subrogation he is entered from the insured to the insurer unless where of this we shall see that that the right is there on the part of a person and the insurer cannot go in its own name it is concerned because this is a right which is concerned with that of a mutual rights and liabilities and the person is only entitled to the parties who are in contract that is who are infected with this liability so assured has to step into the shoes and through that of the insured they can have a right of claim of subrogation a very notable case or noteworthy case is being on this that is in case of masses india days of industries limited i repeat masses indian days of industries limited versus ms mehta transportation company where the supreme court makes an observation on this and says in this case it makes an observation and says this doctrine of subrogation is applied only when there is a subsisting right of action against the third parties only when there is a subsisting right of action against the third parties but where the right itself that is where the right in the third party party itself is not in existence or if it has been already exercised well then this right cannot be exercised well say for example let me is could you put you with a simple live example you meet with a small accident on the road maybe when you are traveling on the two wheeler you meet with a small accident a policeman rush to you maybe in the course of that you may enter into a compromise saying that the person who has injured you agrees to pay you all the medical expenses 
pays out all the medical expenses of what little it had and also pays for you for the damages. Now once when he has taken care of your medical expenses and paid the damages what is being caused to you, are you entitled for the claim again? So you may hiding certain facts in you, you may take the claim, you may make the claim or without showing maybe falsely you might take upon with. So in that case, am I entitled to a right there? Because I have already received the compensation, I have already received the compensation of, of, of that amount of what the damages is incurred to me. Now, once when I have received the compensation or the damages amount of what has incurred to me, I have given up my right of bringing an action against him. So once when I bring up an action against him, the right is already been exhausted. And once when my right is exhausted and even by falsifying the, the, the truth of this, if I claim the remedy, if I claim to take the benefit, there is a second benefit from the insurance company, then insurance company cannot subrogate in my place, that is insured place and claim for the money. Because there in the first case itself, as the, in, the third person himself has no right in head. The, the insured himself has no right in head, the person that is the company will also get no right on it. That's what the Supreme Court makes an observation in the above case that is versus Indian Days of Industries Limited. So what we understand here is this, in order to claim the subrogation or to exercise the right of subrogation, it is necessary that the person that is the person that is the insured who is claiming the loss should have a right first against the third party before where the act of subrogation takes place with. And my friends, this doctrine of subrogation applies to all policies wherever the contract of indemnity applies with. And how is this doctrine conferred with? Friends, this doctrine confers in two ways of right. It confers you with two ways of right. One right is that where the insurer can compel the insured after having paying the money, after having paying the compensation, the insured can compel upon the insured to proceed an action against the third party and recover the loss what the insurer had occurred with. This is one criteria what they can adopt in case of subrogation. Or in the second criteria, they can receive back the money of what they have given it to the insured of which the amount is in the form of ex gratia. They can receive back the money except where then that the benefit of what the assured has received is personally or it is made personally or exclusively. If unless where it is of that money, the there is always a right on the part of the insurer to when suppose say if the insured fails to take an action or if the insured uh, fails to go with that of the uh, third person then whatever the money that the company had paid to you can be called back to be paid back to the company unless where it is not an excretia amount which has been given to you that is which has been given for your exclusive benefit so subject to this my friends you can have a right of right of subrogation so the company would exercises this right of subrogation but however this right is exercised only under two circumstances. I mean, only under two circumstances, my friends. That is one. The first thing is the company should have fully paid you the amount of which the eventuality has incurred in of the or of, of the eventuality what is incurred in the first one. The second one is that this right a right arises only in the respect of the rights which are incidental to the subject matter. I repeat this. This kind of right arises only when the right is incidental to that of the subject matter of loss. So if these two you satisfy with, then fine, you are entitled to go for right of subrogation. But if these two are not there, any lapse on any one of this part would take away the right of you. And it says that the subrogation does not arise and where the insurance himself, where the insured himself, when he has no right on it. Because if it is not fully paid, you have no right for subrogation or where the insured himself has no legal right. That is where if cannot establish a cause of action on that of the claim that what is making, then vice versa, 
we shall also see that insurer will also have no right of cause of action against the other so in this way my friends subrogation works out with i'll take you a small case here that is in case of midland insurance versus smith case a very beautiful case again and i'll take two cases here anyway midland insurance versus smith case one where the insured wife very commonly asked for examination that is the reason why i'm taking this case where the insured wife sets a fire to her house and as the fire was broken the house was destroyed and as a result of that furniture was destroyed house was destroyed the insurance was claimed and the insurance that is the insured the assured was also indemnified for the insurer the question came up that can an insurer take a claim against the third person now who is the third person here the wife can the insurance company take a claim against her wife when the matter goes before the court the court refuses that there is no right of subrogation on the part of the insurer the reason is that see in the purpose of insurance both husband and wife are considered to be as one unit unless you make a difference or unless where it there been specifically distinguished or unless where they are specifically aparted with so husband and wife is considered to be as one unit so when husband and wife is considered to be as one unit if you take an action and if you have paid your the husband of whatever the loss is been caused and in return to this if you claim for subrogation and comes into the shoes of this husband that is the company comes into the shoes of this company the company has to go against this wife and when the company goes against this wife what would happen the same thing the husband invariably becomes a party to this and as a result it would be not a subrogation but again claiming back the amount of what it has been paid with. so that is not been allowed with. that's what the court says here in such cases subrogation is not entitled to so first is that i should have a cause of action and if after having satisfied if i have no cause of action against my wife then you have no right to go with however though under insurance law you don't have but because we are only concerned with insurance law today so we are looking at from the insurance law if you look at from the point of insurance the right of subrogation is not been made but now it, today a small change has been taken place in the law of torts where by virtue as a right under tort a company can go or a wife husband can go against his wife that is on the tortious liability but otherwise than this in case of insurance as a thing the company does not have a right to go nor husband can have a right to go so we see that even in claim of subrogation there is a limitation and the limitation is that this subrogation do not apply to life and personal accident policies i repeat this subrogation i was very clearly saying you then also when the subrogation is applied see contract of indemnity itself is not applicable to all cases and out of those cases that is out of those if any right or exist comes or arises in then company can go for a substitution that is for subrogation that is out of those contracts of indemnity only in the special cases the right of subrogation can be exercised by the company otherwise it is not so what we can understand as to the limitation is when it is a contract of life or when it is a contract of personal accident as the it is those two contracts are not the contract of indemnity wise or wise we shall say that that is also not a contract of what do you say it is it is not a contract of of uh, subrogation or we say it is not a doctrine of subrogation cannot be applied with because of the reason that it is not a doctrine of it is not a contract of indemnity the first limitation the second limitation is that as i then said again insurance must have paid that is insurance must have been paid before the claim of subrogation i should have completed my duty i should have completely performed my duty not partial completely perform my duty so has to claim the right against the third person this is another limitation and the third limitation is that the insured must have been able to bring an action if the insured himself has no right of action as i again then said the 
the insurer will also have no right of action. I will take to you another case because it is again asked for the examination that is in Petroferia versus Thompson case, Thompson case, Petroferia versus Thompson case. Here the case was that there were two ships which was on its voyage and these two ships was belonging to the same owner, two ships case it is belonging to the same owner. Because of the fault of one of the driver or the crew of the ship, because of the fault of what is being committed by one of the crew of the ship, the ship collides with that of another ship which was owned by the same person. Though both these ships was owned by the same person. And as a result of this, my friends, as it was collided, there was a loss of cargo, there was a loss of damage to that of the hull and ship also. Now, on that clause, insurer claimed an amount with the insured. That is, insured claimed the amount with the insurer. Insured claimed the amount with the insured, insurer. And the same was indemnified also. The, com the company paid the amount. And having paid the amount, it, it went for a subrogation. The question came up before the court was that, that can a subrogation be made? I was giving you an example of husband and wife. Husband and wife are considered to be has one unit. In the same manner, if you look upon with, if the company wants to go for subrogation again against whom it is claiming with, it is claiming against the same person to the extent of which the loss has been occurred. So that makes no sense. So there again the court said that, that in such cases the insurance company will have no right of subrogation. So it, while saying or while observing this case, it also said that that where the claim of the ship, it, may, it could be on whoever's, whoever's fault it is. It might be on some fault of some of the person of the crew of the ship owner. That is, who is which belongs to a ship owner. But if the same claim is with respect to the cargo of the insurance and if it belongs to a different person, if it belongs to a different person, then the person can be Old, as, a, as a person who is holding to that of the third parties can claim for subrogation. That is, if in these two ships, if the cargoes belongs to two different person and if that is also being compensated by the company, then if the, that ship, that is, to the cargo which is being destroyed with, for that cargo, the company can have a right of subrogation and only to that extent subrogation can be made, otherwise it is not. So, this right of subrogation can be exercised by the company under special circumstances or in special cases. There can be a question, this, this uh, topic can be asked for the main question as well as also for the short notes. Short notes, they may just go for it calling as subrogation, but if it is for the main question, they may ask you saying that, explain the doctrine of subrogation and contribution. This is the question which may come for the, from the area of subrogation, but generally it is a question for short notes. Next comes the doctrine of contribution and what is this contribution? See, as I was then saying you with this, I was saying you with this, both doctrine of subrogation and contribution somewhat goes parallel to each other. It, it is not the same, but it goes parallel to each other. And this right of contribution generally arises wherein a person insuring the same subject with or same interest with several office or with several companies. Only then the right of contribution arises. See, when subrogation arises, there should be a contract of indemnity and out of that contract of indemnity, if the person has satisfied and because of the default and because of the default of third person, if the right has arised, then if that same is been satisfied, then the company gets, that is insurer gets to have a right of subrogation. But when it comes to a contribution, the same in a different footing we see that this arises where an insurance, where the insurer insured has taken up the policy in two or more companies. A simple example, suppose say there is a fire insurance that I have taken for my house and I might have taken the fire insurance from company A, company B and company C. So I might have taken three insurance in three different companies. So in that case, 
if i have taken the insurance in three different companies and if the risk occurs then the right of contribution comes in from any one of the company in respect of other companies so what we can understand here is that this doctrine of contribution this doctrine of contribution is something we can say it is scholarly or i can say it is something it is in relation with the right of the contract of indemnity to generally arises in cases of property insurance not in case of life insurance it generally arises in cases of property insurance and this insurance or this doctrine comes in only when the insured has claimed the loss only when the insured has claimed the loss and or that is a actual loss and where the company had become liable to pay the loss to the extent of loss what a person has incurred with then the company can go for having seeking for the contribution so it is so that the insured can select the policy in fact it is the right of the insured suppose say if there is a company b company and c company in all these companies he has insured then on the eventuality the insured has a right to choose the company which he wants the suppose say if he has chosen company a then he can choose the company a and he can recover all those amount from that of the a it is not the right on the part of the company to say that no you don't have a right you have an another insurance in a different company you go there and claim it the company the, the company does not have a right it is always the insured right to take that it is his right to choose the company in which he wants to claim it so he can go claim in any of the company he wants that is it could be a or b or c whatever the company he can choose with but the question arises is that once having satisfied this money then by reason of subrogation what the company do the company substitutes here so in place of this a company when after satisfied it substitutes then it can go against this b and c company for a contribution saying that see i have satisfied i have indemnified all that money to the person but in the same way you are all also liable so please pay me the proportion amount of what you are also liable to me so when the company goes seeking for the money in proportion to what these companies are also liable we call that to be as contribution mind this this doctrine of contribution arises because of the liberty of where the assured that is the insured has insured the same property in two different or more than two different companies or with more than two different insurance in fact we still say this is a form of double insurance also but one again you should keep it in your mind is that all double insurance are not a, a insurance of contribution because when it comes to a double insurance my friends double insurance alone cannot form to be a contract of uh, that is doc applying the doctrine of contribution unless where the insurance what has taken is an over insurance unless what he has taken is is an over insurance then they can go otherwise it is not the double insurance suppose say if the property is worth of 10 lakhs of rupees let me say in this way if the property is worth of 10 lakhs of rupees and for each of this i might have taken 10 lakhs of rupees maybe the loss might have cost for 50 lakhs of rupees then i can go claim for each of the amount in each of the company each of the company i can claim but if the property is oh man the property the the, the uh, loss is 10 lakh and i have taken a A, a policy in each of the company to an extent of 50 lakhs of rupees then it is 1 is to 3 i may pay all this 50 lakhs but i can claim the same from one of these companies or i may pay all this 10 lakhs of rupees and i can claim at the ratio of 1 is to 3 with the other companies so that is what we can speak with the contribution that's why we say that all double insurance are not an insurance of contribution a mere double insurance alone will not give a right to contribute unless where that insurance is an over insurance if it is not an over insurance then no say for example like this i have taken the again i'll put in a different sense if 50 lakhs is the insurance what i have taken and the insurance 
uh, what you that is I have taken might be just three lakhs of rupees. Three lakhs is being paid. Now, having taken three lakhs, I cannot go down again year three and year three. I cannot claim the same thing. So there is a different footing on all these things, my friends. In that scenario, we have to look down and see one contribution can be taken. With. So there are certain conditions which has to be satisfied. The first condition here is that the insurance should relate to the subject matter of which the claim is being made. Suppose, say if I have taken the fire insurance on the particular property, then it should relate to the uh, property of which the fire insurance is taken. So, first condition is it should relate to the same subject matter. The second condition is that it should, that is in all these three companies, one, two, three companies, it should cover out the same interest with all the companies. That is, if I have taken a policy, the policy concerned with the, all these three companies should have the same kind of interest with all the three companies as such. Same kind of interest I should be holding. And the third condition is that the loss should be caused and it should be common to all the parties. Whatever the loss that is being caused, that is from out of the peril, it could be some peril could have taken place, the loss must be common in all the purpose. That is, all this policy should be of fire. If it is not fire, maybe if it is fire, if it is for burglary and this is for storm or any natural disasters, then I don't have a right to go with. I don't have any right to claim with and neither the other company can go for a contribution. So if I am to take a contribution, the loss should be common in all the policies. And all the policies which I am holding here should be a real contract. That is real contract in the sense it should be a legal contract which should be entered between the parties and it should be enforceable in nature. And without any stipulation it should have been imposed in it without having any exclusion to that. So when you satisfy with all these conditions then my friends the company shall have a right of contribution my friends. However my friends these principles of contribution as I then said to you, is not applicable to life insurance or where it is also not applicable to the contract which is not a contract of indemnity. I am referring to you in exceptional cases of where fire insurance is taken with. In such cases, it is not applicable. And how is this method of contribution taken place? Quickly with the methods, my friends. When it comes to the method of contribution, see, contribution can be taken in two methods. How? is being made. Calculation, how the company goes into the calculation. One is the contribution is being made in proportion of the sum assured to the maximum limit. I repeat, the contribution can be made in respect of the proportion to the sum assured to the maximum limit. Suppose say 50,000 is the amount what I have insured. 50,000 is the amount what I have insured. Suppose if company, in a company, provides me a risk coverage of to an extent of 50,000 and in B's company it covers me a risk of 40,000. So A company, B company. Now if there is a loss to the extent of this then what is the company liable? Suppose say if there is a 30,000 loss to my company because of the fire. Now how is this company liable? What is the proportion? Out of this 30,000, if one of the company can pay entire this 30,000 or if B company can pay entire 30,000 and can say or it may call upon B company. That is this company taking the total amount of this 30,000 money. It can call upon the company. Pay, this company may pay 20,000 of the loss what is incurred and call upon B company to contribute for 10,000 rupees. So that the amount can become in full. So this is one way where contributions can be called by that of another company. The second way is this my friends. The contribution can also be made in proportion to the liability of the person which are independent liability on the basis of independent liability basis. Like the other one I was saying to you. Where it says that where the liability comes according to the proportion of the sum insured liability occurs according to the proportion of the sum insured then the company becomes liable to claim upon such money in proportion to that of the sum insured say the same example of 50,000 when I take 50,000 now how it is the company is liable that is 1 is to 2 1 is to 1 taking the same example that is 
payable of loss if the loss is to an extent of 30,000 so what I will be doing here is that see it is I can in other way I can mathematically if you are going to put across with it is uh, one what is the loss 20 into 10 1 into 10 that's so how we calculate with that is in proportion to that the company has to make the good of losses so on the basis of this ratio the company may call upon to pay this amount so in these two methods my friends the contributions can be claimed by the person friends in this way we can see that this is again a special kind of uh, doctrine wherein we see that the right of claim can be exercised with mind this my friends as i was discussing to you with the contract of that is an insurance contract is a contract of utmost good faith is applicable to all kinds of insurances whereas in case of insurable interest though there was uh, previously we see that there was a limitation but now it is universally accepted saying that every person who takes up an insurance should have an insurable interest this is again a primary requirement which is applied to all cases of insurance and when it comes to the third criteria it says this that if a, if it is a case of contribution if it is a case of subrogation it is applied only in limited sense that is whereas it is a case of contract of indemnity whereas it is a case of subrogation whereas if it is a case of contribution these are considered to be a special doctrines special doctrines which are applicable and of course we also have a doctrine of reinstatement these are the special kind of doctrines which are applied only under special circumstances only under special circumstances and not universally applied to all those areas that is what makes a difference with that of the the first two kinds of the principles which we have understood with however my friends we shall see that in order to have a valid contract of the contract under the contract of insurance you have to go with all these principles you have to follow with all these principles and wherever where it is applicable these principles has to be accepted and followed